Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Paul Salem, Senior Vice President for research, uh, Policy Research and Programs here at the Middle East Institute. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you all today at this event that will be looking at challenges facing uh, media and reporters uh, in Syria since 2011. Prior to the outbreak of the conflict with the Assad regime, media in Syria was heavily monitored and under regime control. As protests broke out and civil society efforts for reform gained momentum, so did a diverse independent media presence. Independent news outlets provided crucial reporting to domestic and international audiences and served as a platform for dissent. These outlets have faced enormous challenges and uncertainties that come from reporting from a war zone. Here to discuss these issues, we are honored to have with us award-winning journalist Rania Abu Zaid. Rania's book, No Turning Back, Stories of Life, Loss, and Hope in Wartime Syria, is based on her time reporting from Syria in 2011 and after and is available for purchase outside. Uh, we look forward to Rania sharing with us her insights as to how journalism played a role, particularly in the early stages of the uprising. Uh, MEI fellow and co-founder of the Syrian nonviolence movement, Ibrahim al Asil, is also with us today. He will be sharing his views about the challenges facing emerging media in Syria. Also with us is MEI's Antoun Isa. Antoun is MEI's director of public relations and former senior editor. He is the author of an article entitled Syria's New Media Landscape, a report that's available on our website. This report examines the rise of independent media in Syria as a result of the conflict. And joining us to moderate the panel is The Atlantic's Yuri Friedman. Welcome, Yuri. He covers U.S. foreign policy and has written extensively about the Syrian civil war. He was previously the editor of The Atlantic's global section and the deputy managing editor at Foreign Policy Magazine. Thank you for joining us. Uh, before we begin, a bit of housekeeping. We are recording this discussion uh, for posting on our website, so we ask you to please silence your mobile phones, but we do encourage tweeting uh, and do use the hashtag MEI Syria if you do so. I also want to call your attention uh, to MEI's expansion campaign, our largest ever fundraising effort. We are renovating and expanding our traditional home around the corner on N Street uh, so as to accommodate MEI's rapidly growing activities and capabilities. That will include a new art gallery, conference space, and the like. If you enjoy and benefit from our work, please consider making a donation, and there are pledge cards at the front desk. Thank you again all for coming, and please join me in welcoming the panel. And Yuri, the floor is yours. Thanks, Paul. Um, so just to lay out a little bit about what we're going to do, um, I'm going to ask a first round of questions. We'll do some follow-ups, and then we'll make sure to leave some time at the end uh, for questions. So please you know, keep them in mind, and we'll, we'll try to get to you and get to everyone uh, before the event is over. Um, so, Rani, I wanted to start with you. Um, you know, we are sitting here today seven years uh, away from when the Syrian uprising and civil war began. Um, and I'm wondering if you can take us back to that period. You know, in your book, um, you write about how seven years ago, not just in Syria, but across the Middle East as a whole, um, social media and satellite television spread a new revolutionary pan-Arabism. Um, I'm wondering if you can take us back to that period and what it looked like, particularly in Syria. And in your book, you do this through the eyes of a character named Suleiman and through his work uh, at a bunch of upstart outlets, uh, including something called the Sham News Network. And I'm wondering if you can take us back there through his eyes and explain what it was like. Sure. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who's here. Um, to talk about Syria, a subject that is uh, very difficult to get airtime these days. Uh, Suleiman was a, a young, privileged man. He was from a family that had connections to the regime. He had money. He had a great job. He had prospects. But he knew that he was a privileged young man, and he felt that others should have some of the opportunities that he had. So just a few weeks into the uprising in late March, um, he participated in his first protest. And given the, the, the heady atmosphere in the region, let's not forget that uh, in those early months of 2011, uh, Husni Mubarak had stepped down after 18 days. Tunisia Zain al-Abidin bin Ali had fled. Uh, 
Gaddafi was teetering uh, Yemen. There were protests in Yemen, Bahrain. There was, there was this sense in the Middle East of possibility. And Suleiman was caught up in it. So during his first protest, he almost instinctively held up his camera phone and started recording because he said he wanted people to know what was happening in his hometown. And that was how he became a civil activist. And he came to work with an outlet that was uh, known as the Sham News Network um, almost by accident. He was looking for ways to disseminate his information. He was, he was literally Googling news outlets. He was uh, Googling Al Jazeera, Googling Al Arabiya, trying to find somebody who might take his footage and upload it. And he came across this site called the Sham News Network, and it posted his footage. But the thing is, he never knew who was behind Sham News Network, and they didn't know who he was. He was afraid of them knowing who he was, um, and they never asked him. So much so that messages uh, were always typed, never spoken, because they feared that voices could identify and potentially incriminate. So that's how he started and how he came to be a civil activist. And what happened to Suleiman and the Sham News Network over time as the civil war deepened? Uh, what became of him and what became of the founders of, the, of Sham? Well, unbeknownst to Suleiman, because he didn't know who the founders were. And in my book, I, I go back and I trace um, who they were. And the, the founders of Sham News Network came to play a role in the arming of the revolution a very key role in the arming of the re revolution. So in some ways, it shows you the um, trajectory of uh, the uprising in Syria, how it moved from one uh, form of uh, civil resistance, if you like, to, to armed actions. Antun, you've w tried to train Syrian journalists and work closely with them um, when you were at al uh, You've also written a report where you've traced how the media in Syria went from being this tightly controlled domain to a landscape dotted with, according to your count, at least 200 media outlets. Can you take us you know, inside how that evolved? How did it go from one to the other? And what is the state of Syrian media today? Well, I think Rania's um, summary of Slayman and his story is pretty much an illustration of how Syrian media quickly just um, changed. Um, in the first few months, so that first year actually, 2011, where, um, and it was an indication of the government actually losing control. So, uh, you know, as we know, prior to 2011, Syrian media operated pretty much like North Korean media, you know, state-run, nothing could get through, it was a top-down kind of approach. Um, and with the government losing control in 2011 of a lot of areas, and priorities shifting to maintaining protests, they didn't really keep an eye on media so much anymore. Um, and as a result, you know, we had activists trying their best to get information out as to what was happening in the protests. Um, and I was in Beirut working as an, a journalist um, in 2011, and I was, you know, the story in Beirut was, how can we verify these stories? We're getting the regime account of um, X, Y, and Z happening in a certain area. We're getting activist accounts of mass shootings and deaths and detentions. How can we verify there's no reliable media on the ground? Um, and so Syrian activism, I think, moved into the sphere of trying to fill that void, trying to disseminate credible, verified, or verifiable information as to what was happening in the ground in Syria. And as a result, you saw this proliferation of um, these kind of grassroots quasi-media outlets, whether on Facebook pages, whether on um, YouTube, social media, they were the immediate channels. Um, and so I guess that's probably the start of how it all kind of went. Um, Ibrahim, you, you know, uh, before in the 2013 and 2014, in the early years of the Syrian civil war, you were in Syria at points working up close uh, with a lot of civil society initiatives, including um, media initiatives. What did you witness in Syria itself about how the landscape was shifting and the, mm -hmm. and the challenges Syrian journalists were facing. Um, thanks, Yuri. So if you allow me to build on what uh, uh, Antoine and Rania uh, just said, after 2011, and as probably an act of resistance to the regime, 
people wanted to create a lot of platforms to express their opinions and to communicate their messages and also to, to get the news out from, from Syria uh, to the international media. And they hoped that if the world knows what's going on in Syria, that would change uh, their reaction and they will get help. And then we, we witnessed a lot of uh, proliferation of, of media inside Syria, hundreds of, uh, of initiatives. And they were, most of them, they were very local and they were secular and they were unorganized. It's kind of very similar to how the revolution uh, started inside Syria. By time and in the next two years, they started to, to, uh, to form clusters and to come together and trying to, uh, to form bigger uh, uh, initiatives. And then also their work started or their priorities started to, to shift. For example, uh, in the two years you mentioned, 2013 and 2014, there were also uh, some priorities to do some counter-radicalism work. So many of the Syrian activists started to, to write about uh, the reviews of, uh, uh, of Islam and violence uh, because the, the jihadists started to say, if you are a Muslim, you have to be a jihadist. So many of them started to write the, the counter uh, message of, uh, uh, of what's going on besides and trying to, to get the message out um, uh, to the world. And some examples of, uh, of those initiatives is uh, Anib Baladi. Anib Baladi is one of the most successful uh, initiatives in Syria in the last seven years. It was founded in 2011 uh, in Daria. It started on a very, very small uh, scale. Uh, then they started to grow and become uh, more professional. Uh, they never stopped since 2011 uh, issuing their weekly uh, newsletter, except in two weeks in 2012 when the Syrian army encircled and stormed Daria and uh, committed uh, uh, a massacre, like uh, killing 100 people uh, every day for five days in, in a very small town. That was uh, the only incident when they stopped. And they kept evolving till this point, uh, as uh, uh, Antoine mentioned. And now it's very interesting to see what kind of work they do. They're trying to, to revive some of the old TV shows that we used to see on the Syrian TV, on the culture side, not politics. Hmm. And I think with that, they're trying to create a parallel Syria, besides the one the regime that's trying to control. Because now in Syria, the regime is controlling bigger and bigger land by, uh, by time, and they're losing ground. So they're trying to make sure they don't lose the, the virtual space that the civil society created where people can think and talk uh, and, uh, uh, and communicate their messages. Do they have the resources to do that? Can they create something like that? Or is it just a, a, a dream, an aspiration? No, actually, it's, uh, uh, it's a reality now. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the biggest challenge, uh, challenges of the Syrian civil society or what they're trying to do is to make sure their media outlets are the reliable ones, not the regime ones. So now even, I mean, if you want to go and see the people in Damascus and in Aleppo, when they want to read articles, not, not the political news, because this, this is like a red line on where you are, what, what you want to believe, and your security. But if they want to read about the Syrian history, mm -hmm. if they want to read, uh, uh, if they want to listen to a show discussing the Syrian music, they go to Suriyali radio, mm -hmm. which is part of the civil society. The regime, I think, part of, of the change in Syria in the last seven years, it lost the control over the, the social structure, regardless of the army and the armed conflict. I'm talking about how the society is formed now. The civil society and the revolution and the activists succeeded in creating a different reality or different structures where people from different sides go and read and interact with those uh, outlets. And Abeladi now uh, uh, has, I think, around one million followers on their page. And we're talking only about Syria, like mm -hmm. a small country. So you can imagine the, 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 the size of following uh, uh, they got in the last uh, few years. Do you think these things can survive if the, uh, these groups, if, if, if Assad asserts control over much more territory and kind of consolidates his gains and emerges in some way victorious? It can, can this mm. be sustainable? Can they retain the social space? Yes, I think so, um, especially that many of them now they are operating from outside Syria. Mm -hmm. They have like smaller points inside Syria and sometimes they have to move, mm -hmm. depends on the, uh, the armed conflict uh, scenarios uh, on the ground. But they, the, I think they will succeed uh, in doing that, especially because the armed conflict it is taken different directly, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, trajectory. So the Syrian civil society wants 
to make sure they will have their own space, regardless of the outcome of the armed mm -hmm. conflict. And that's why they are focusing on that. And they shifted also from focusing on the news, which how it started. They just wanted to let Syrians and the world know what's going, mm -hmm. to more intellectual discussions, mm -hmm. to more cultural programs and shows, uh, whether on their, their radio stations or uh, magazines or their uh, video uh, programs on, on social media. And I think to a very far extent they succeeded in doing that. Hmm. You know, we can talk about Syrian media as an abstract concept, but Rania, one thing I was struck by in your book is you have a scene where you describe news coming out that Assad might be prepared to step down in 2012. The Russian ambassador in France had said something to that effect. And you describe the scene in a town where there's celebratory gunfire in the streets and people are pouring out of their homes ecstatically and parading around. Um, you describe in another point these free Syrian army fighters glued to their computers following the news. I'm wondering, um, is following the news a wholly different experience when you're in a war zone? than it is in any other circumstances? Does it have a certain, is, is it kind of absolutely vital in a way that we don't think about when we think about just following the news you know, here or anywhere else? No, absolutely. It's a luxury to live in a place where you don't have to follow the news because not knowing the latest information is, you, you don't need to know the latest information. It's not literally a matter of life and death. And that's a luxury to be able to switch off the news and not have to follow it. Most definitely. Yeah. Are there, were there certain outlets that you found that were most, when you were doing your reporting, were there certain outlets that you found were most prominent in being able to convey what was happening on the ground that, that people kept turning to? I think you have to be to? careful because yeah. um, an activist is by definition an advocate of a cause, not an objective observer yeah. of something. So we have to be careful when we talk about independence and to, to, to make the distinction between independent and activist, because otherwise, which, you know, I mean, some activists are, are and, and even activists are a spectrum. Some of them are ex extremely reliable in terms of the information. Some of them are um, mirror images of Syrian state TV, and they hide some of the things that their own side does in the same way that Syrian state TV manipulates the story of what their own side does. So we have to be clear, it's, we're not talking about one particular thing, it's a spectrum and it runs the gamut of, of all of those um, uh, you know, varieties. Um, but certainly, you know, there are some who, who are, uh, it's very difficult as well uh, to push back against um, armed forces, for example, to criticize your own side when your own side um, is, uh, might be uh, various militias and where, it, you know, when you're in a fragmented war zone where every man with a gun has become an authority, it's a very difficult thing to criticize the um, uh, mistakes or the uh, uh, crimes in some cases of your own side. And that's something that also needs to be discussed when it comes to the dissemination of information about what has been happening in Syria. And that is something that we as journalists who cover Syria must always be mindful of not just the information, but who is providing the information, how can we verify it, and how reliable is it? Just because somebody says something happened doesn't mean it's true. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. in, in very um, emotional circumstances, East Aleppo or uh, Ghouta now, or wherever it might be, we always have to um, keep our journalist hat on, not put on an activist hat, as journalists covering this and try and verify information as best we can. What do you follow when you're trying to get news out of Syria? What do, what do you... I usually, I'm in Syria trying to get the news. You're doing it yourself. Syria. Yeah. We follow yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Thank you for doing the great coverage. Um, do you think there's such a thing as independent media in Syria? I mean, I think there, there are certainly aspirations to, to independence, definitely. Mm. There are some people who, um, who uh, I have found to be credible just because of my personal interactions with them. Um, you know, I, I won't talk on uh, Skype, for example, with uh, somebody who I haven't met inside Syria, who I know is in the town that they say that they are in, and mm -hmm. who I know is a credible source of information. Um, but I understand the challenges when you're not in Syria, that not everybody can go to Syria and, and you can't um, develop those relationships. I understand that challenge, but what I'm saying is that even um, w when we're faced with that challenge, we must be aware of, of these issues. 
that you know we are often interacting with activists or that we have to bear in mind they may not be professional journalists in terms of the standards of verification and things like that and that's also to be expected to a degree because you know this was born spontane out of spontaneity and they weren't trained uh, the, some of the, many of them were uh, people like Slemen who literally picked up a phone and just started recording nobody sort of taught him about um, the ethics of journalism or, or anything like that. And he doesn't, he didn't think of himself as a journalist. That's the other thing. I mean, we, we can't also be labeling people or, or um, placing labels on people that they themselves don't use to describe yeah. themselves. He was an activist. Yeah. I, I had that experience too. I, I spoke a couple years ago with Abdelaziz Al Hamza, who was uh, one of the Syrians behind something called Raqqa is being slaughtered silently, which was tracking developments in Raqqa when ISIS was in control of it. Um, and at one point, you know, he explained that he was a biology student at Raqqa University. Um, and he said, when he explained why he was doing what he was doing, he said, you know, if I don't do it, who will? Um, and when I, at one point he said, some people call me a human rights defender, some people call me an activist, some people uh, call me a journalist. So I said, well, what do you call yourself? And he said, I'm Aziz. Mm. Um, I'm a Syrian, uh, mm. nothing more. Um, and uh, you know, in, in one sense, I think, one, it's, it's just incredible um, to watch how Syrians um, from all walks of life have bravely turned to journalism as a public service during a period of acute crisis for their country. But Antun, you also point out in, in your report that there are some downsides to the kind of confluence of political activism uh, and citizen journalism in the sense that it has created um, doubts, generated doubts about the accuracy of the reporting. If you have a political agenda, how accurate um, is what you're reporting? And that's just not a concern for Syrians trying to track the news, but also foreign media. You know, you often see when the BBC does a report, you'll see this video could not be independently verified, right? We see that all the time when we're seeing reports from Syria. Um, so there's been some skepticism about that. And then also it, it raises questions about the sustainability um, of these new media outlets in a post-conflict Syria, even in Syria today, in the sense that these people are um, not necessarily committed to journalism long term. Um, so can you go into some more detail about what this blending of citizen journalism and um, political activism has meant for the future of, of journalism in Syria? Well, before we get to the future, yeah. um, I think it would be good to kind of uh, just outline and build on what Rania was saying about the kind of the, the, the difficulty and the challenges in when you're not in Syria, and if you're a foreign media uh, outlet, if you're a foreign journalist based in Beirut or Istanbul, or even in the US or the UK, um, and you need to get a story out on Syria, and you can't get boots on the ground, you don't mm. have, um, I mean, you don't even have, uh, you know, helpers on the ground to, mm. to feed you information that's on a contract or anything. You have to rely on local sources who you have never met before. And so, um, you know, you get a report done, and you know, I can tell you from, Inside the newsroom, you get a report done, and the editor starts asking you questions. Have you verified this? Who's mm -hmm. this person? Have you met the person? Like, you know, how do you know this person's saying the truth? Um, and and you know, if you look at the reporting of the Syrian war, particularly in the first two or three years, I mean, there were there were several cases of um, you know accounts that were published that weren't verified and turned out to be not entirely accurate. So um, and when those uh, stories, there was that infamous story with that BBC published that photo of that girl jumping over all these dead corpses but that happened to be in Iraq, but they posted it as being in Syria. Yeah. After that came out, um, you know, foreign editors really clamped down. And um, hence the whole, you know, we have to emphasize verification. Yeah. Um, uh, and that kind of put a bit of impetus on the Syrian, um, I guess, the would-be journalists uh, inside the country to start professionalizing there, um, a few things happened. That, that was the first thing. They, there was this impetus to start professionalizing um, their stories. And then there was a lot of support coming in from uh, Western media NGOs um, to start training Syrian journalists or in these areas that have lost, that, where the government no longer had control, um, mostly in southern Turkey, on the ethics of journalism, on the technical aspects of journalism, so how to you know, film, how to record, how to ask questions. Um, there were you know, a whole range of things. Um, and that was possible because at that time, <coughs> Turkey had an open border policy um, and a lot of Western NGOs set up shop in Gaziantep and so forth and were training repeatedly. And their, the standards started to improve. And so as a, as a consequence, uh, the, the stories coming out of Syria um, you know, were, were, were better sourced, so to speak. Um, then uh, in addition to that, um, Syrian media outlets that were starting to be formed 
Um, several of them started to take this aspiration of becoming more independent and actually building a, a media culture in Syria that met the standards uh, of you know, objective reporting um, and analysis and so forth. Um, in my report, um, I mean, I tried my best, and it's probably not the most perfect attempt um, to try and differentiate between that kind of activist journalism um, and independent journalism, because there was a difference. There were a few media outlets in Syria who, you know, were probably sympathetic to the revolution, for sure, but, you know, they, they were determined to establish a kind of independent, respectable, reliable um, media culture in the country. Um, which is part of the revolution in, in many ways, so to speak. Um, and they sought themselves to differentiate from, you know, the kind of activist media um, that would propagate one side against the other. Um, so, I mean, that was the, dif I mean, the, the difficulty was there, but there were pathways to get out of that difficulty mm -hmm. in the early stages. Um, going forward, um, you know, it's, you know, in a war zone, it's really hard for an organization to stand on its two feet. So a lot of the support coming from, a lot of the support for these organizations is media organizations that want to be independent and want to kind of build this kind of media culture in the country um, is, is, comes from external sources. So, you know, um, funding from here, funding from Europe and so forth. And as the Syrian conflict starts to lose its priority, I guess, in foreign policy um, for, uh, you know, Western nations, so does the funding start to dry up. Um, and so I, uh, my concern for the future of um, this kind of independent media strain in Syria is that it has been dependent on you know, funding and support from the US and Europe and so forth, um, is that that support will disappear in the next few years. Um, and the, the country just is, is not in a situation where these organizations can stand on its two feet. Um, so that's my concern. Is the funding still, <laughs> is funding and training and support still happening at the moment? Is the, is the US government, um, European governments, European and American NGOs, are the, yeah. are, the, are the levels, have the levels been similar or have they petered out? No, the Euro, the, the, I mean, several European governments have maintained their support. Um, there's still questions about the US government, obviously, because you know, we just had a change in hands yesterday in terms of um, the head of the State Department. Um, he, I'm sure he'll do a review of the programs that have been in place. Um, so that's a question. Is the, is the State Department funding that was happening still happening at the moment in terms of? Uh, from, from what I hear, and I think Ibrahim can elaborate as well, I yeah. have heard that it's continued mm -hmm. for the time being. Um, okay. Because, I mean, uh, uh, but you know, there are concerns going forward, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, and particularly as, I mean, it's all looped in together. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, as Syria becomes less and less a priority, um, and being in the news and being on people's, people's minds, um, I mean, the less willingness there is to give money to, you know, the situation. Yeah. Um, but for me, I mean, like, maybe Ibrahim can, I mean, you can counter my argument. Like, I, I just, I don't, I can't see how these independent media organizations can survive without the funding and support that they've been given so far, um, given the current context in Syria where it's just impossible to, survive as an organization. Yeah. Ibrahim, yeah. I'm interested in your thoughts on that. And also, I'm just wondering if you could also speak to how the constraints of war in particular have shaped the way journalism is conducted in Syria. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, very basic things like a lack of electricity and internet, um, uh, physical dangers, um, political fragmentation, and also a loss of human capital. How, how has that shaped the, the, the nature of journalism as well? Sure. Um, so on the funding, uh, um, side, yes, I think it's a, it's a big uh, challenge, but probably I think many of them also could create different ways of, of getting funds. Some of them, for example, they're getting funds from the Syrian diaspora as well, like the Syrian American community and, uh, and other business communities. They are trying not to focus only on government's funds because of the, the points you, uh, you mentioned. And uh, yes, I think it's uh, uh, very significant and important to uh, uh, to keep watching that and, and to see where things are going. Uh, but also since we're talking about only few numbers of them that survived and that became professional, also I think now they have more experience on how they raise funds and they get funds. So probably that's uh, mm -hmm. kind of assuring. Um, regarding the, uh, the war constraints and uh, things on the ground, uh, it definitely made everything more difficult. I remember, for example, when I used to go to, to Kaframbil in the north, and the, the activists, so during the day, the activists usually they do everything. 
I mean, they try to distribute AIDS. Uh, when there is uh, an airstrike, they get their phones and they film. Uh, then they get on their motorcycles and they try to, uh, to get the injured to the hospitals. Uh, and then they go, they print newspapers, and then they Skype with the media outlets. Um, and when, so when they want to do any interaction through the, the internet or, or, or post some news or videos, they try to do that in a very short uh, time because hmm. they know when the electricity uh, uh, goes off, for example, they have their batteries and it lasts, for example, for 20 minutes. And there are three of them in one room. So they say, like, we ha you, you have seven minutes, I have 10 minutes, etc. And then they organize their work, and it's, uh, it's fascinating. And, and then they go, like, they turn it on, and it's like an operation room. Everybody working very quickly and trying to get uh, their job done. Um, and regarding other challenges I would like also to, uh, to touch upon, I think the, the armed groups is also a challenge. Uh, although they are both seen from the international community as one side against the regime, internally it's not that easy or that simple. Many crackdowns came from armed groups and many activists were detained. Many newspapers were shut down uh, in those areas. So the activists or the senior civil society is also trying to, uh, uh, to face that challenge and to find ways where they can continue operating without just going into, into an open confrontation where they all get detained or killed. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to, to find uh, that balance. Uh, another challenge is actually the, uh, the Russian media and the smear campaigns against, for example, the White Helmets. Mm -hmm. One of the most successful initiatives and projects in Syria, and it's under constant attacks. And, uh, and even, for example, Faraz Fayyad, the, the director of the uh, the movie on the, on the White Helmets, Last Man uh, in Aleppo, who got nominated for the Oscars. There is an interview with him in the New York Times, and he's speaking how, how they're trying to accuse him of being linked to Al-Qaeda. And then I know him on a personal level. He's really afraid. I mean, he's, he's getting text messages, emails, phone calls every day, like you, Al-Qaeda member, etc., just because he tried to film a story inside mm. Aleppo about people trying to help injured people. So also, that's a big, a very big challenge. So we're talking about very local challenges from the, the, the armed groups to the electricity, mm -hmm. and they were moved to the more national one against the regime, etc. And then we have those challenges against very powerful media outlets trying to counter the message of very small uh, uh, media outlets and local ones. So just to imagine how difficult it is for those uh, media activists. And is that Russian media campaign geared at discrediting these groups to an international audience? Like, what, is, what, is the, what, what do you make of what the intention of these Russian smear campaigns are? So from my very personal observation and from what my fellow activists uh, in the Syrian civil society, what I hear from them, they feel they are under, I mean, like, they feel all their efforts are being targeted uh, uh, to, to make sure they don't have any story they can tell. This is their feeling. I mean, I'm not saying there is something organized against them. I don't have mm -hmm. the proof uh, to prove that. Mm -hmm. But there is that feeling in the Syrian civil society. And there is a lot of pieces in the New York Times and Washington Post, etc. We can all uh, go and read them and get uh, more uh, in depth. But it's really a very, very big challenge in the Syrian civil society. And they're trying to to overcome that, but it takes a lot of resources and, uh, uh, and, and efforts because it's not only against the Syrian regime, it's not only against a local player, it's something very international and very uh, big, so it's, it's really significant. On that point, I, I want to ask you one more question on that. Yeah. I, I want to read you something that the United Nations expert Richard Gowan recently wrote. Um, he was res responding to these competing claims by Russia uh, and the United States about what was going on in eastern Ghouta. Uh, with the Syrian government's bombardment of the rebel-held enclave. Um, and he, he noted that nowadays with unverified social media posts and sophisticated state propaganda, like some of this Russian propaganda, and also the complexity of kind of a civil war wrapped in a proxy war, you know, inside a great power war, um, that we have a fragmented media landscape, different images, different narratives, no facts beyond doubt. When there is no common agreement on what is true, you can't speak truth to power. That's what he wrote. And I, I'm wondering, what, uh, Ibrahim, what do you make of that observation? Um, is there something particularly challenging about covering the Syrian conflict in an era of you know, <laughs> propaganda wars and claims of fake news? It, are, are, 
it's always, war is always chaotic, but is there something particularly challenging about covering this war at this moment in time? Yes, certainly. And uh, as Rania and Antun said about trying to verify the information coming from Syria, even within the Syrian civil society, there is that mechanism. Because sometimes you have people, for example, in a besieged area, and they get emotional, and they think, like, if I say 100 people got killed, nobody is moved, let's try to say 200. And they were trying to make sure, is that right, is that not, before we communicate it to, to the international media. So it is very difficult, because sometimes things get emotional, and sometimes people are frustrated. Mm -hmm. And then also for more technical challenges like the funds, the resources, uh, what language uh, uh, to use. Because for the local initiatives, when, when we had that argument with them at some point about what, what kind of languages to use, would you say the, uh, the fighting parties? Do you say the regime? Do you say mm -hmm. the war criminal? Do you? And for them, some of them, they say, I see your point but I'm not the BBC, I'm a local activist, I wanna convey how my community feels. Mm -hmm. Which is also, I mean, it makes sense from one point of view, but you also want to, to, to create that bridge between the international media and the local activists mm -hmm. to speak the same language and try to, to, to encourage the activists to be as neutral as they can. But it's not easy. I mean, when you are reporting news about your own family, your own village, your, the things you love, it's very, very difficult to become neutral. You're not saying, yeah, so yeah. that's one of, of the challenges, besides, of course, the one you, you just mentioned, where it becomes part of also an international conflict and regional uh, conflict, and, and it's always difficult to, to, uh, to report the news and to find an outlet that's also willing to take the news and, uh, and uh, write about it or talk about it. Yeah. And Rania, we've been talking a lot about Syrian media. I'm wondering how, what do you think about how foreign coverage of the Syrian conflict has changed over time since you've been covering it uh, back in the early days of the uprising and the Civil War? And also, what obstacles um, you've run into in trying to convey your reporting to international audiences? Well, we can't get into Syria anymore. It's, uh the Turks have erected a concrete barrier along the border there, and they're shooting dead anybody who's trying to get across. So that's one obstacle, um, which makes it very hard to get into northern Syria to see what's happening there. From the regime side, visas are very difficult to come by, um, and they blacklist people all the time as journalists. So it's very difficult now to... to it, it was always difficult to get into Damascus and, and Assad-controlled areas because he needed a visa. But it wasn't so difficult in the early days to get across from Turkey into northern Syria. And with time, that border has become um, much, much tighter to the degree that now, as I said, um, you literally risk death if you try and, and get across that border now. So we can't see what's happening. And that's very frustrating. It's very when, difficult to, to, to report a story when you're not there. When's the last time you were there? The last time I was there uh, was in, on that side was, um, uh, I'm going to say, like spring 2016. And I was there mainly for book research to do the last bits of uh, research for the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was uh, uh, the hardest journey I've ever taken. I mean, I'm always smuggled in and out, but that one was just, um, it was really, really difficult. Did you go through Turkey? or? Yeah. I did. Yeah. I did. So it's very difficult. I mean, logistically, it's difficult to, to, to get in. And in terms of interest, interest has waned. And, you know, we've seen this. It's a long-running conflict. It was the same thing with uh, Iraq. It's the same thing about, with Afghanistan. How many stories about Afghanistan do you see in the press? Um, and so this is a sad reality that, that um, interest waxes and wanes. But in, in uh, my experience and the experience of my colleagues, who not only cover Syria and the Middle East, but broader international stories, all Trump all the time is locking out so many other stories. And I think that that is dangerous, especially for um, in the US, because it's not as if you're locked out of the world. You're still engaged in the world politically, uh, diplomatically, militarily. So you need to understand the places where, where you're trying to either influence or where you're present. So um, I think it's a very dangerous um, approach to not really understand what's happening in beyond your borders, and, and it's been really, really difficult to get uh, not only serious stories, but, um, but international stories. The, the news hole for foreign, uh, for foreign stories has, uh, has shrunk. And it, it seems like it's such a paradox, too, because 
you're saying you're, you've had more restrictions in getting in as a foreign journalist, but in some ways, you know, over the long course of the Syrian conflict, uh, which just happened in the 21st century with all these technologies, we have more real-time information about this conflict, arguably, than we've had about we many... We have snippets. We have, but we have snippets. We have snippets. Mm -hmm. I want to know what happened before. I want to know what happened after. I want to understand the context. I want to know who's filming it. And I want to see what's beyond the frame. Let's not forget that social media is often things that somebody hmm. wants us to see. We need to see everything. So th that's, that's a big constraint. And how does a conflict constructed in terms of coverage with snippets, what does that mean for uh, the picture we have of the Syrian civil war at the moment? I think there will be case studies written about, I mean, Antoine has, uh, has done something about the Syrian media, mm -hmm. but, but I think there will be, I think Syria will serve as a case study um, just to answer that, that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Antoon, what Assad is asserting more control over over uh, Syria at the moment? What do you see as the future of of Syrian media? Like, w what do you realistically see happening to this to this uh, this rambunctious media that erupted out in two thousand eleven? Two two years from now. Well, I think we've got to. I think one thing I, I, I tried to point out in my report was not so much. I mean, yes, there are, you know, the number of media outlets, where they're located, how they're going to get funding, how, who's reporting, how they're going to do, you know, that kind of technical side mm -hmm. of things. Um, but I think it's also important to look at the trends that have happened um, in the last six years. Um, and the kind of shift from this kind of top-down media culture where information was just consumed by the state. Um, now it's kind of not that way anymore, even in the regime areas. Um, you, Spencer, know, you, you mentioned in your report that one interesting th development in the regime areas is that there's been these Facebook pages yeah. that have yeah. uh, come up that are actually kind of community-led exactly, um, and are somewhat, you know, they're not going to directly challenge the Syrian regime, but they, they also kind of are, serve as barometers of the public mood in some of these regime areas yeah. and act with some level of independence, yeah. right? That's an important shift, and that's happened nationally. It's across the board, not just mm -hmm. in regime areas, but there's this this national shift towards people being able to kind of, you know, hold their own kind of partisans to account. Well, not to account, but they, it's just like, you know, couch their words in a, in a way, but at least engage in the discussion. Mm -hmm. You know, prior to, um, you know, 2011, or especially under the ease of Hafez and Assad, you couldn't even talk about politics. Now everyone's talking about politics. Even though they're feeding into the narrative of the people they're supporting, they're talking about it. And that's an important shift. From in a society where political conversations was never had before, mm -hmm. and you've, we've got to talk about it in those terms. You know, political culture and media culture are kind of intertwined, and it's, it's starting from ground zero in Syria, in that sense. When you've had 40 years of a complete blackout, that's an entire generation where political or open thinking or critical thinking has never been kind of part of social thing. You know, the the, the way society operates. Now that and now, especially with social media and smartphone technology. Um, and making it more difficult for governments to control information. Um, and especially in Syria, even if Assad does take control over the whole country, which is still unlikely, um, uh, but he'll, you know, even if he does, um, it, it requires a lot of capital and resources to control information um, in the day of the technology that we have. And Syrians have access to that technology. And the, the shift, that cultural shift from not saying anything about anything so now I'm talking about politics, I'm going to keep talking about politics, and starting these Facebook pages and posting on these comments. That's the future for me when it comes to Syrian media, because that, that's instilling into a generation that you are able to speak, that you couldn't do that before. So you don't think that's a genie that Assad can put back in the bottle? No, I don't think he can. I mean, unless he wants to put all of his people into jail, which I'm sure he'd love to do, but I mean, he doesn't have the space. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a depressing thought. Um, <laughs> Ibrahim, I'm wondering, also, from the perspective of someone in the Syrian diaspora, and there are many Syrians right now who are outside of their homeland, um, how do you keep informed about Syria? How do people in the Syrian diaspora uh, you know, stay abreast of what's happening? And again, just like we talked about, Rani, with you, in, in Syria, this is, uh, news is of vital importance. So is it outside of Syria? You're following. What if you can get back to your country? You're following if your family and friends are okay. This isn't just like the nightly news broadcast. This is something much more. So, uh, how, how do you? How, what do you stay uh, informed mm -hmm. about, and what what do others um, in similar situations do? Mainly through uh, 
different Syrian outlets that through the, the last few years proved to, to, to be credible uh, through the different incidents that Anton and uh, Rania mentioned. Uh, by time we realize like some of them they exaggerate or they just uh, spread fake news etc but mm -hmm. I think now there are a few outlets that people know they are credible and reliable and that's where either Syrians or non Syrians usually get uh, their information from sometimes they are newspapers or sometimes they are just uh, individuals who are known and they have Twitter accounts or uh, Facebook accounts and then you can uh, follow the news uh, from there uh, regarding also so it's, it's not the New York Times or the Atlantic or the BBC <laughs> not always <laughs> <laughs> okay I'll take it uh, <laughs> but w w what do you what do you think you're getting through that that you're not getting through these big mm. news outlets because I think a lot of us are getting I'm certainly getting a lot of my news from you know major American news outlets yeah. what, what are we what am I missing by following those as opposed to what you're what you're tracking so the Syrian conflict is many layer conflicts right I mean you're talking about different layers of conflicts overlapping. And usually the, the international media, they just see the armed conflict. Hmm. And now when we're talking, for example, about the control in Syria, we all imagine a map colored different armed groups who's controlling what. This is important, significant, and it tells a lot, but this is not the only conflict. Beneath that map, there is a lot of changes. And, and who controls the structure of society. Prior to 2011, the regime controlled Syria, not only media, not only the, the military or the security branches, it controlled the structures within society, from sport to art uh, to uh, uh, factories, etc. Now those structures are not controlled by, by the regime. So even if the regime becomes an occupation force of all Syria, as Antoun said, it won't be an easy task or it won't be uh, achievable to recontrol uh, uh, all Syria again. So I think that that picture is um, usually overlooked in, uh, in the international media when they talk about Syria. They focus on only one layer, which is very important, but I think there are many different layers that we need to, to see and to, uh, to understand. For example, now we're talking about, I mean, this is an example of Ghouta, mm -hmm. that people might be displaced and then the regime will control Ghouta. Well, the regime will control the land, but tens of thousands and probably more of people will be displaced. They will take their dreams, their pain, their stories with them wherever they go. Would they be, I mean, even if whoever announces that the regime achieved victory, would they accept that? Mm -hmm. They won't, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, I think this is uh, an interesting point. Usually in victory, in, in, um, uh, in any conflict, the one who is actually matters to announce victory is not the one who's actually achieved victory, but the other party. Hmm. Because if they don't say we lost, you can't say that the conflict is over, regardless of how they transform their way of resistance, etc. So it's not about, I mean, the regime saying, yeah, I ended the conflict. It's like, we, are we going to really achieve that point? And I don't think so. I think it's mm -hmm. really the, the, the Syrian conflict, there are many, many phases that it would go through, and that's absolutely unfortunate. In the military, they refer to that as the adversary gets a vote, is often. It's, it's not yeah. just, it's not just uh, when you declare victory, that, that there's, there's uh, the other side has to, you know, to agree with you on it, to acknowledge yes. it, exactly. All right, um, why don't we uh, take a time for questions now to make sure we have time. Um, we'll start over there. Intimidation. I'm intimidated almost every day on the kind of stories that I need to do. Delusion happens. Uh, we were attacked in November, and that changes the way you look at stories every day. Are we going to get attacked again? So every day I send out my reporters, I'm looking at the perspective of how can we get the story but not get attacked but not get intimidated. So how do you, tell us, how did you... Uh, Direct it to me? Yes. No, it's a, it's a big issue, and it's, especially, it's especially big for uh, local Syrian outlets that live there. That's why I was saying that um, the presence of the armed groups is an intimidating factor, and it's very difficult uh, for um, local Syrian journalists or activists to report on some of the excesses of their own side, even though some of them are doing that. I mean, f f uh, in my personal experience, well, I, I wasn't living in Syria, so that's the first thing. I was going into Syria, but then I was coming back out. But um, I was going in there frequently, and I, I faced um, 
I was blacklisted by the regime, first of all, in the summer of 2011, banned from entering the country, so that side was locked to me. So, but even on the rebel side, I was often hauled in for interrogations. They didn't like my work, they didn't like my story, some commander was upset. And that happened often. And the, the thing that um, I relied on was that it was the truth. Point out where it's wrong. Point out where I misquoted you. Did you tell me that? You know I'm a journalist, you know that's what I'm here for. Did I ever tell you that I wasn't? And so far that, that has worked for me. But I know that it doesn't work for others. And I know that um, you know, there are some people you can't reason with. For example, there were some um, cases where uh, Syrians would call me up and tell me, listen, maybe you shouldn't go to this area because Commander so-and-so is really not happy with your story. So I would heed that advice and I'd stay away. You can't always push back. You can't always confront because you have to know when to confront and when to pull away for your own safety. Um, so that was my personal approach. So there were areas that I would stay out of. I mean, at one point I was warned not to return to Aleppo because if I did, there would be people waiting for me. So I mean, this is the, the level of intimidation that, that um, I experienced and sadly many Syrians experience it even more. Um, and and it's, it's a huge challenge. So I, I understand what you're saying and I sympathize with uh, with the decisions you have to make, especially as a manager, to send people out into that environment knowing that uh, they may be harmed. It's, um, it's a, a very difficult thing to do, but we're there and we're trying to do our job, so we have to do that and try and mitigate the risks as well we can, as best we can. Okay, why don't we go with you? Um, sorry, we'll bring the microphone over and add. Um, just please also introduce yourself uh, before asking the question. That'd be great. Thank you. Hello, Horatio Ureta, uh, retired from the U.S. Department of State. As you're talking about, the, you know, the, the influence of, you know, on different media outlets, the, uh, the Assad regime, you know, or the media that's pro-Assad, how much influence is there from external powers? And by that I mean specifically Iran that has, you know, s supported the Assad regime so much on, you could say, even using Syrian media as propaganda or even to an extent, you know, broader, say, Iranian goals or not, because you know, they're not very happy with the Saudis or the Emiratis or, the, or that. So the influence of external forces on the media. Um, you guys want to take that? In terms of funding or? The like, messaging? I mean, the Syrian media, the Syrian state media has maintained the same narrative since day one. And it's, it's kind of, it's been effective, which is that uh, it's one of nationalism. It's one of secularism. It's one of protecting the Syrian cultural mosaic against a jihadist invasion bankrolled by Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey that's trying to erase Syria's minorities. Um, and the Syrian way of, not Syrian minorities, sorry, the Syrian way of life, which is that, you know, we're Muslim, we're Christian, we're Druze, we're Alawi, they're trying to get rid of our cultural ancient civilization, yada, yada, yada. That's the narrative that they've been spinning, and it has worked for a lot of um, Syrians that support the regime. They buy into it. Um, because then they just put a flag of, they show images of, um, you know, uh, Islamist opposition and it kind of validates their narrative. Um, so that's actually not probably the Iranian spin because the Iranian is a bit more Islamist. Yeah. Islamist. Um, mm. So um, I don't think the Iranians have, you know, are involved in that sense. Um, so. But if I may add, everybody's trying to spin everybody. I mean, you know, the Iranians might be trying to spin their lines. So are the Saudis, so are the Qataris, so are the Turks. So is the Syrian opposition. Everybody's trying to spin everybody. So it's, it's not a one-sided thing. I think what's interesting also is that so while the regime is doing that for their supporters, the Iranians and Hezbollah are spinning the Shiite jihadist narrative. You know, save, say, the Zainab shrine. You know, um, everybody has yeah, this. So it's the stories it's, that they tell themselves. Exactly. So they have these competing, like the completely different narratives, but targeted to the same kind of supporters, so to speak, in a way. Uh, right over there. Hi, thank you. My name is Joanna Kador, and I'm a Syrian American analyst. And my question is actually for Ibrahim. Uh, could you, you mentioned in your first part um, about how civil society is recreating and rewriting uh, parts of its history and its culture. And perhaps you didn't want to share necessarily with the audience, but you have your own initiative, Sardi Suriye. Uh, if you could please talk, I think it would be really great if you shared with the audience what you're doing. Uh, what you plan to achieve and how they can watch it too. 
Thanks, Jumana. Uh, I'm afraid they can't watch it because it's in Arabic. <laughs> but those who speak Arabic, so it's, um, it's been um, a while working on this uh, show, which is called Ser de Suri. It means a Syrian narrative. And by that, I mean that the whole idea be, be behind the show is to tell or to spread the message that Syrians can, can talk about their own narratives. And it's not the Syrian narrative, it's a Syrian narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, because under totalitarian regime, when you grow up, there is only one narrative you can talk about. And when, when everything happened in 2011, we realized that we can talk about our own narratives. But that also takes a lot of work and research and uh, uh, to talk to different uh, communities and different components of the Syrian society to see how Syria evolved and why we are the way we are. So from the, the show, I'm trying to, uh, to move the, the Syrian argument from just, I mean, if you are pro or against someone, to more of who we are and what we want to do and want we, what, we, what kind of a Syria we want to, uh, to have in the future. And uh, to achieve that, we need to understand as Syrians uh, where we came from and why our borders are, for example, mm. the way they are, why the, the regime is the way uh, it is now, and why we were not able in the last few years to, to have a different uh, outcome uh, from the conflict. So that's it, and actually that's, that's also another reason why there, there are no subtitles, because many friends, they ask for subtitles, but we want the show, me and actually my brother is working with me as well, to be directed towards Syria and to give that feeling. Because again, many Syrians sometimes when they feel that you're saying something to a different audience, they have that reaction, like, no, we don't want to, to engage. But when, when they feel it's a Syrian-Syrian uh, argument or discussion, things are different. And I realized in the last few weeks uh, after starting publishing the, the show, the friends request and followers where they're coming from. And it's um, uh, interesting that, again, they are coming from areas under the regime control or areas that are well known to be loyal to the regime. So that's also something uh, uh, I'm trying to achieve. And thank you, Jumana, for highlighting that. How are you distributing that? So it's on Facebook. Uh, we started that only through uh, uh, our uh, personal pages. Uh, but also uh, other platforms, they reached out and they offered to help. So now we're, we're trying to see how we can take the, the number of viewers uh, to, to the next level uh, by partner up with, uh, with different uh, platforms. And are you speaking to Syrians both inside the country? Like who, who is giving these kind of narratives and testimonials? Yes, so, uh, so it's based on, on, on research and, uh, and interviews. And I'm trying the words to use to be away from the conflict, not because I think it's mm -hmm. more important than conflict, it's very important, but then you give those who are under the regime control the chance to share your post without being uh, under any threats. Mm -hmm. So that's why I thought if we go back and we talk about history, you can, mm -hmm. through the argument, the way you're discussing your history, etc., the way you're criticizing the present or the past, to convey your messages and also to give an option to those who are whether loyal to the regime or afraid from the regime to be able to engage with you in the discussion and also to share your ideas. Mm. Okay, um, right in the back, uh, the, yeah. Uh, my name is Zaid Musto, a Syrian journalist and uh, CEO of Accuracy Press Institute. It's a nonprofit organization focused on developing Syrian media. So uh, my question to Ibrahim, you, uh, you said that there is uh, some reliable uh, platform, media platform in Syria that uh, we can like uh, get the news from them, independent news or objective news. Uh, can you like specify some? Uh, I, w I want to follow my uh, actually uh, question with comment. Uh, I think uh, uh, journalism built in freedom and prof professionalism. Uh, I think in Syria we still we we have a freedom now, uh, as you guys mentioned. There is a lot like of. Uh, platform, social media, but we're still uh, lacking the prof professionalism on the media platforms and still the independent media platform established still working in, with the mentality of, uh, of activism, not uh, uh, independent journals. Thank you. Um, there are different platforms. I'll name a few. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying they are the most reliable, but those are the, one, the, the ones I remember. Ina Belady 
they are b b English and Arabic, so they have also their uh, English uh, Twitter account and Facebook page and website, so uh, it's easier also to follow them. Uh, Radio Suriali, uh, alsuria.net. Uh, so I'm not saying I, I always agree with everything they say. We all do mistakes, especially that the Syrian uh, outlets, they are still learning. But mostly I, I rely on, on those sources when I try to understand uh, what's going on and what's happening, besides also some individual uh, accounts of people tweeting, for example, from Ghouta, et cetera, in English and uh, uh, in Arabic, like the Violations Documentation Center uh, in Duma now, it's also, they are very, very reliable, and uh, I encourage everybody to, uh, to follow them. So those, just to, to, uh, to name a few, uh, and uh, probably uh, also uh, Rani and Antoun, they have their own uh, sources they follow. Yeah, I was going to say, do you guys have any other um, places you want to mention that are, are particularly go-to sources for people trying to get the best picture of what's happening in Syria? I don't know. I mean, I, I also read the Arabic stuff as well, some mm -hmm. of the Arabic tweets and, and things like that from people who I know. Mm -hmm. But all, you uh, most of the things that you said. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to list a few of those independent media outlets in my report. I think I've got their names and so forth in there. So. Um, uh, I can't think of this, this, I can't think of all of them off the top of my head, but um, there's something called Raya FM, which is based in Istanbul. Um, I know they've kind of uh, made it clear that they try to maintain an independent line, um, and they've actually said the things that you've just said. Like they've criticised that kind of activist journalism that doesn't maintain that objectivity. So I'd, I'd, I'd reach out to them and see if you can listen to some of their reports. And they also do some of that cultural programming as well to kind of mm -hmm. give that. Yeah. Um, sense of another, a different kind of Syria, not just neither the regime Syria nor the Islamist Syria, but a Syria for all. Mm -hmm. um, um, there's a few out there. They're hard to find, but they're out there and they're working hard. Okay. Um, uh, why don't we go here and then we'll go to you, sir. Uh, Andy Cook, uh, University of Leicester. Um, I really have a question uh, uh, regarding the term citizen journalist because actually 99% of them are not journalists, uh, have no journalistic training and have no ambitions to write the news. A lot of it is just narrating the story of their lives as they are living it. In fact, you know, a vast amount of data coming out of Syria was not aimed at creating news. It's just telling stories, isn't it? I'm not de de belittling the, the story that they're telling. I'm just saying that that is what we're seeing because of the ubiquitous use of the smartphone. Well, that's the problem that I was alluding to at the very beginning um, from, you know, that editors would, you know, highlight that, um, you know, there is a distinction. I think every journalist who's a, a journalist would say that. There's a distinction between, a serious di distinction between journalism and citizen journalism, and the distinctions are often the ones that you just mentioned. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I agree that's the case. Um, and, but again, in, in, I guess in this context where, you know, and this is not going to, uh, unfortunately, given how human civilization is, it's probably not going to be the last time a war erupts in a country that was previously authoritarian and there wasn't a media culture. And how are we going to report? This is a challenge for us going forward when it comes to reporting wars. How are we going to report wars mm -hmm. when we don't have what we think are reliable journalists on the ground covering mm -hmm. the stories? Does that mean we don't cover the stories? Does that mean we uh, minimize the human atrocities taking place? Um, does that mean we ignore these stories? Like, how would we... How, that's something we, as an industry, a media industry, have mm -hmm. to kind of discuss and determine how we're going to report this going forward. Do we just point these guys out and say, okay, these aren't citizen journalists, they're just local sources, this is their account, and this is how we're going to report it. Um, and I think uh, as the Syrian war went on, um, there was more of that cautious reporting. Okay, you're not a reliable journalist, but I'll source you as maybe a local source who, with these quotes, and will, as my job as a reporter, I'm going to try to find more information about this story to make sure the story is full of facts and information. So the the reader or the listener can objectively come up to their own conclusion on the story. Um, but, you know, it's a good question and it's, it's, it's an ongoing challenge for the industry, for sure. I don't know, do you want to add to that? No, I mean, what you said, all of, we need to have that discussion, but I think that we should all also just admit what we know and what we don't know and don't try and extrapolate and don't try and speculate and admit also the sources of information. 
and where it's coming from. Um, just be transparent about the information, how we're getting it, and um, whether or not we can verify it or not. And that's what media are doing by putting the, you know, this video cannot be verified yeah. stuff. We have to be open about how we're getting the information. Yeah. Okay. Over there. No, we'll get Hi, uh, Nick Riker, another uh, British analyst currently living here in Washington. Um, there's been a couple of references to funding training infrastructure being made available to support the growth of independent journalism in Syria. And I suppose I have two questions on that. Is to what extent has it been successful? Are programs like that actually successful in growing independent journalism? And then there's that notion of what's independent mm. for the second question, which is how much of that funding, training, infrastructure support actually comes with an editorial slant or not? So based on the research that I did for my paper, um, uh, uh, the, I mean, it's, it's hard to kind of, you know, I'd have my, the conversations with the various kind of departments that would be responsible for supplying the funding. Um, and of course, the questions were asked, you know, did you editorialize? Did you get involved um, in the kind of, you know, the stories that they'd make um, or contribute? And they said, no. <laughs> but um, they would, you know, first they outsourced to professional media companies. So US and European governments did not directly train, um, and, you know, would be journalists in Syria. They outsourced companies like BBC. Um, they had BBC ran a training program in southern Syria. Canal Plus in France ran a training program in Syria. Um, Dutch, Swedish, German um, media entities or NGOs. So they, they contracted these guys to do it for them. Um, and so uh, the, and, and the training was across the board. So some training programs focused on the more technical things, you know, how to hold a camera, how to write a story, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, others were more on ethical um, journalism. So get multiple sources, um, don't be sectarian in your language, um, don't be derogatory towards women, include women, um, uh, don't incite hatred, yada, yada, yada. So uh, that's as far as the training went in terms of ethics, um, as far as I'm aware in the research that I did. And now whether they were effective, um, yes, I think they were effective in helping those would-be journalists first develop their skills because as Aranya said, a lot of them just picked up a camera and, and they didn't identify as journalists, but all of a sudden Reuters and AP and AP kept calling them, so they're like, okay, I'll be a journalist now. So um, I think it was effective in giving them the necessary tools to effectively report on what they were seeing. Um, now, whether those stories were getting out and getting through to us on this end, I mean, as I said, you know, they're competing for uh, different major stories and it's hard to maybe get that through. But I think it helped them give them those tools. Um, on the question of what's independent and not, do you want to have a go at that, Anya? No, no. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. that, that's a question I asked. Yeah. I asked you in the beginning. Define independent for me. Yeah. So it's um, yeah. In this, and again, look in, in a war zone, and look, we've seen this throughout the Middle East. Um, you know, I, Palestine, Lebanon. When war's involved, emotions run, ex, you know, ex, extremely high, and it's very. High. When you're a journalist, you have to. You can't have emotion involved in covering war stories. You know, and I mean, Rania and I can both share you stories, and we come from the same press corps in Beirut. And you know, that summer of 2014, when we had ISIS and the Syrian war and Gaza all happening at once, journalists, you know, press corps, uh, for Western journalists were breaking down. I mean, there was PTSD amongst press corps, and they, we didn't have any support. Um, uh, but it was hard to maintain that, um, you know, that kind of professional reporting without getting emotionally involved. And that's for Western journalists. Imagine for those Syrians or Palestinians or Lebanese or Iraqis who are actually there living this and we're expecting them to write stories to our standards without, as Ibrahim was saying, these are their families and their homes that are getting mm -hmm. destroyed. How, you know, so there's, yes, we have to keep on insisting, be professional, be professional, but we also have to be empathetic to their circumstances. It's, it's, it's much harder to be independent as we would like them to be, um, you know, without, and, and expect them to put their emotions aside, so. Okay, right in the back, right over there. Uh, Ken Meyercourt, uh, AUB grad. Uh, first to comment that question. Um, I appreciate the, the panelists uh, following through on Ms. Abu Zayed's uh, 
suggestion that there be transparency in admitting that uh, some, maybe most, of the anti-regime so-called independent media is funded from abroad. In addition, along with that and the 35,000 troops that were allowed to, uh, 35,000 fighters who were allowed to enter the battle zone through the territory of a NATO ally up to the uh, present occupation of a part of Syria, Syria by American troops. And if, if you want to get the American public interested, Ms. Abu Zayed, maybe you could convince the uh, Pentagon to tell us just how many American troops there are in Syria. Uh, anyway, this all seems to confirm the, uh, the Syrian government's narrative that Syria has been targeted by uh, uh, Israeli-friendly Westerners, Western countries, in order to neutralize the one uh, Arab state that still confronts uh, Israeli aggression. Now the question, uh, who is Syria girl and what's her story? Uh, what was the question? Who is Syrian girl, and if you're not familiar with Syrian girl, you haven't no. been uh, checking what? all sides of the... Is he talking about partisan girl? No, it's talking about the, um, the, the blogger in Edinburgh. Is that who you're referring to? The no. Syrian Observatory mission? Oh, the Syrian Observatory? Uh -huh. No, I'm not. Who are you? Who, 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 I, what do you want to clarify your a question? A very attractive girl who calls herself Syrian girl on the internet and has a following with people like me uh, who has been <laughs> providing information about what's going on in Syria. Well, what's her handle so we know who she is? There are lots of Syrian, Syrian girl. girls. Are you sure it's not partisan girl? <laughs> Syrian partisan Pretty? girl? Because there is maybe, one. Maybe. Yeah. Is that an attractive young woman? She is. That is probably her. <laughs> she's Syrian. If she's Syrian, she's bound to be attractive. <laughs> That's all you know about her? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll get to it where uh, we have time for a few more questions. So we'll go right over there first. Uh, Deep. I'm Daphne Pellegrino with Reporters Without Borders, and I'm wondering, so we've been discussing how international media outlets have been going into Syria and helping to foster this independent media environment, um, providing them with training to report ethically and um, balanced and unbiased, and I'm wondering what the sort of um, efforts that those media outlets have been providing to Syrian journalism as far as like protective mechanisms go for reporting on the grounds um, and if you think that international media is doing an adequate job in providing protective mechanisms for freelancers going into Syria as well. Well you did the report so. Um, are you going to defect to me for that? <laughs> <laughs> you did the report. <laughs> uh, well, for, well international media I think, well, I think this is more I guess uh, um, I, I, in terms of giving report support to journalists on the ground, I mean, probably not enough. I would say um, they do a lot of contracting. They have, um, you know, guys on the ground that do a lot of the hard work, um, uh, fixes and so forth. Uh, that don't get any protections. They're not on their payrolls. They don't get any benefits. They don't get, get any security. Um, and they do, you know. The bylines might be, you know, Western names, but often, and that, these journalists would say this to you, like a lot of the people that help mm -hmm. us do these sources are local fixers, mm -hmm. no names, uh, and, if, and they're usually the ones that pay the price if the story doesn't turn out the way the people in those area like. So there isn't enough protection. Um, and that goes not just to the reporters and the freelancers, but also to the fixers that they're relying on to get these stories. Definitely not. From the international media perspective, there is the argument from the organisational side that you know, uh, if we sign to these people on contracts, then, you know, we have to do massive payouts when something goes wrong. Um, the, obviously, the other side to it is that people are risking their lives to get these stories out. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, we both have friends in the region who work for big papers, but they're not on staff. Um, they're still contracted, um, but the contracts are very loose. Um, and there isn't, there's, there aren't enough protection mechanisms. And these guys have been on contracts, these kind of loose contracts for years, and they've been demanding to get onto the, the, the payroll and the staff to get, to become full staff so they can get the protections. And big companies like New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal won't do it. So, um, but they will still keep on pushing these guys out to get the top stories and the scoops and the breaking stories of, in, in war zones. So it's, yeah, we should probably have editors from Washington Post, New York Times, and Wall Street Journal up here so you can ask them that question. Yeah. But, yeah. 
OK, right over there. My name is Jordan. I'm from uh, AU. Thank you so much for talking to us today. It's very informative. Uh, and I'm sorry if this is not your area of expertise, but have you noticed a similar kind of budding of journalism in not just Syria, but other countries like Iraq, Egypt, or countries affected by the Arab Spring? Any such similar results? Who's that addressed to? Oh, it's just an open question to the panel. Yeah. You want to take that? I mean, the thing about um, technology is that it has made it easier for everybody to disseminate their views. So, and it has, um, it's democratized the, the information business, if you want, in one way, because it's, uh, the barriers to entry are a lot lower. It's not expensive to get on Facebook and, and post something about uh, what you're seeing in your neighborhood. And it's not expensive to hold up a, a smartphone and film something that's happening that you want the world to see. So in that sense, there's a lot of information out there. But it's, uh, it, in terms of, uh, I, you know, I don't know, in terms of uh, broader media outlets, like if there are new newspapers. Yes, I mean, you hear about new newspapers. Um, but uh, on a very sort of personal level, it, it, it means that anybody can, can um, now have a platform. And anybody can also interact with professional journalists via a platform. Anybody can tweet uh, at any of us. Um, and this is something that wasn't the case before when you'd send an email and, and you don't know if the person received it or if they didn't. So it's, um, it's, it's lowered the barriers to entry. I'll also add that I think looking at different Arab countries at the moment is a good kind of, uh, provides good potential foresight into how Syrian media might evolve. So you have kind of like the Lebanon and Iraq model where you have uh, a variety of media outlets, but it's kind of in, in the American kind of landscape. You know, one political supporters of one political faction will watch one media outlet, yeah, another supporters will watch another media yeah. outlet. There's no crossover. Everyone's in silos. Yeah. Um, there's no conversations mm -hmm. happening between people of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also have the Egyptian model, where for five minutes we had independent media after Mubarak fell, and it was great. And it was the beacon for the region, um, and now all of a sudden they're just, you know, either thrown in jail or forced to recount, recount you know, ridiculous stories. Um, so if the regime succeeds, the regime would love the Egyptian model. If the regime succeeds in um, establishing full control as it once did, it will probably go by the Egyptian model. And the Egyptians will probably help them achieve that because they're friends behind closed doors. Um, but I think Syria has become so polarized um, that I think we might end up with more of the Iraq or Lebanon model where you have kind of wealthy people from different perspectives setting up media outlets and then supporters just flocking to what they think is right. Um, so the kind of the Fox News and MSNBC you know, situation in this country, hmm. yeah. Okay, we'll do one last question and then wrap up, yeah. Thank you. I'm Rafa Jabouri, um, a journalist with Al Arabi TV now, formerly with the BBC, and I cover Syria um, since the conflict started. Uh, my question is about the, um, the part of Syria that is now controlled by the SDF, the American-supported uh, SDF, which is, of course, most of the area that is, as you all know, uh, east of the Euphrates River. Do you see a better environment for the media and journalism there? And do you see any American interest in supporting better journalism and reporting from there? Thank you. Uh, I think there is an American interest in supporting free and independent media. Whether this current administration is aware of that interest is another matter. Um, and that is important because if you know, the Trump administration has succeeded in creating this space um, in the country where it has in direct influence and where it can actually, on the ground, condition its local partners to you know, at least embrace or respect diverse media opinions and outlets. Um, uh, I think Charles Lissom might have a better answer <laughs> to that question or whether, they, whether the US um, is going to do that. Um, I don't think it's likely with this current administration. Um, but that's why we're here. We're here to, you know, keep repeating that message. You know, it's not just military that you need to do. You can't just defeat terrorism. Militarily, you need to kind of develop an 
you know, a, a different narrative on the ground, um, different conditions on the ground to prevent extremism returning. And part of that is having a free and open media. Um, so we actually do have a space in Syria where that is possible, um, but I, so I agree it's possible, but I don't think it's going to happen with this administration. Wait, Paul, do you see a clash with, um, do any of you see a clash with, with the uh, radical Marxist Kurdish nationalist lines of the, uh, of the SDF, which is controlled, of course, by the BYD? It's power dynamics, you know, if the Americans aren't supporting the Marxists. In terms of the local control, who controls the media and the area? Yeah, I mean, certainly there's a clash, but when you're getting your support, when your power is based on the support of a superpower, and if that superpower tells you, allow diverse media, otherwise we, we're not going to support you, then I, I dare say that they're not going to say no. You know, so. Okay, um, well, thank you guys all for joining us. Thank you to the panelists. Why don't we give them a round of applause for joining? Thank you.